Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation as part of the Industry Insight webinar series. The topic this time is legal technology trends, threats, and innovations. Speaking today will be Tomas Siros, Chief Solutions Architect for Advocates Law. As Chief Solutions Architect, Mr. Siros applies his technical, legal, and business acumen to define business requirements and achieve cloud-based practice automation for his clients. As the spearhead of a global sales engineering team and while working daily with Advocates' client-centric sales teams, he defines business, technology, financial, security, and usability solutions for Advocates' private cloud, mobile, and legal practice area-specific platforms. Mr. Shiros earned a BA at Tufts University and a JD at the University of California Hastings College of Law as a member of the State Bar of California. In his downtime, he stays active with his daughters and is an avid surfer, triathlete, snowboarder, and scuba diver. The presentation today will be followed by a Q&A. Please enter your questions into the question box in the webinar panel on the right side of your screen. All questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We're recording this webinar and we will be sending a video and a follow-up email in a few days. We'll also post the video on our blog at www.lawtechnologytoday.org. Thank you all for joining us. We'll now begin the webinar. Thanks, Austin. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, spending some time with us today. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm the Chief Solutions Architect at uh, with Abacus Next. I've been involved with legal, legal technology um, based here in San Diego for uh, for over 12 years. And what I've seen is a, a true tipping point uh, being reached where the adoption of legal technology is now uh, is is fast moving, and it really is a uh, it's it's a it's a significant change in an industry or profession that has kind of historically been risk averse and kind of late adopting when it comes to understanding how to leverage technology, how to use new services, new you know uh, security protocols, a lot of the things that uh, that are now becoming commonplace and even required. Um, for to run and manage a, uh, a modern law firm, and you know the days are gone where emails would be printed and stacked on your desk, or uh, or dictating letters to be typed up later um, was kind of a norm, or even kind of stacks and stacks of paper files, um, you know, kind of creating a a, a castle on your desk. Um, that uh, that is long gone now, where the need for uh, electronic communications for integrated systems for reports and intelligent business intelligence to be at your fingertips uh, that's becoming the new norm and so what I'll touch on today during our uh, our conversation is some innovations that I've seen trends in the uh, in legal technology where it is now where it has been and of course where it's moving I'll touch on some imminent threats because I know uh, it's clear that there is a global um, attack in essence, against law firms and other uh, professions that have a high standard of care, your your need to protect client data and have access to it in the, in the course of, of running your business has created kind of a uh, a threat where a lot of hackers and specifically ransomware we'll touch on um, has become an imminent threat and clearly on a global scale. I mean, you know, anyone who who read the news recently heard about DLA Piper being affected and having a global network uh, crippled. Right uh, for days and days, where no one could actually use a phone or a computer. You can't check your email. Those kind of threats are becoming more widespread at a global level, but also on a on a small level. So everyone is uh, is must be prepared, um, not only understanding what the threat is, but how best to kind of protect yourself proactively against that. Um, and so then we'll we'll touch on understanding kind of mitigating risk um, in within your firm and your practice. I'll touch on kind of the tipping point of what I see going forward, and then we'll open up, as Austin mentioned, a Q and A at the end. So just definitely type in your questions as we move uh, as we move forward, and we'll cover those. So let's talk about some innovation. So where what are the legal technology trends that I've seen um, in you know the 12 years that uh, that I've been working with clients directly with with firms and um, and quasi legal entities, um, and also what is kind of what is the the uh, the hotbed of innovation? What are the trends that are moving forward quickly? So the first one I would, was touch on that that must be addressed is automation. So it's not it's not making the lawyer redundant or unnecessary. What it's doing is understanding that in the course of business, in managing cases of, of whatever type of uh, of law practice you have, um, automation is the ability to take the administrative steps. The things that you know need to happen and happen regularly and consistency or consistently, excuse me, um, and automating them. What can that mean? That can mean workflow. So consistent step-by-step -step kind of process management where day-to-day -day individuals know exactly what needs to happen. And then if you take a step back from a management level, understanding workflows that are applied consistently throughout the firm means that you have the ability to see exactly where things are, who's doing what when, what happened last week, what happens today, and what we need to get, kind of be aware of. Um, in, in the coming, you know, in the coming months and even years when you're tracking deadlines, that can be uh, quite a few, uh, some time out in the future. 
So the workflows, the consistency, automation, and of course reporting, right? The ability to know uh, at a glance the firm financials, the business side of your practice, as well as productivity and other management tools that are built into that kind of automation. Oftentimes it's calendar driven and oftentimes in your calendar, the ability to create and standardize your best practices and then apply those as a workflow, like a sequence of steps that, you know, start, middle, and end can be applied um, regularly is, a, is a, certainly a trend that I'm seeing a lot of clients benefit from. Um, the second one that is touched on is, uh, is security, right? And then also the cloud infrastructure, the ability to no longer need or be reliant on single points of failure, whether it's, you know, hardware, a server that's on site, or, you know, if you have a couple of offices, it's VPNs and the kind of tunneling secure, you know, kind of a complex uh, IT infrastructure that has been kind of the norm historically, I'm seeing a lot of shifts for, away from that so that, you know, having someone else host your environment, both the, uh, you know, the information in it, the tools you need, and also, you know, kind of proactively monitoring not only the health of the infrastructure, but also from a security standpoint, making sure that you, you are not um, exposed in any way. And if you are, you're notified immediately and you kind of have remediation strategies built into those that infrastructure. Um, it also kind of gives you benefits. So you're no longer location or device, you know, um, uh, locked. You know, that kind of location and device agnosis is a means that wherever you are, whatever device, whether it's your smartphone, your tablet, your laptop, your desktop, Mac, Windows, Linux, uh, you know, Chromebook, it starts to remove uh, a lot of the barriers that existed um, in the past in order to kind of preserve and protect environments. Instead, what we're seeing is, you know, there, there's a broadening of accessibility um, using, you know, kind of flexible tools, really, uh, that you um that you prefer to use. That's a trend we're seeing. Also kind of firm client collaborative environments. I think the interactivity and the ability to create a portal, right? Or a, you know, a, a secure environment for the exchange of information, the ability to ask questions, kind of store, share, and even collaborate directly with clients. That's something that's becoming uh, a norm. And a lot of clients are actually expecting that now. And it helps the firm too, because you can subscribe in essence to a, you know, a collaborative workspace where your client and outside counsel can have access to real-time information. So you're updating it, you know, other parties are updating it, and everyone is kind of uh, aware of where the case is without the need to contact, you know, any of the uh, parties directly. So those kind of collaborative environments are becoming a, a standard and a norm. There certainly are, there's efficiencies to be gained in having a location that is all updated with, you know, real-time information. Um, the next thing I'm seeing, which I uh, appreciate greatly, is firms that are actually having cybersecurity assessments uh, performed. The goal there is to establish, one, any weak points, two, training, right? Being able to have your staff know exactly how best to protect, you know, themselves when they're, you know, when they're using and accessing um, information, using all kind of technology tools that are available to you, and also understanding that, you know, um, that, that the real way that ransomware is spread is because, uh, you know, IT environments are not updated. Individuals don't know how to protect themselves. They're making, you know, the, the, uh, the human element oftentimes remains kind of the security weak point, but training and consistent protocols and having those cybersecurity assessments so you know exactly where you stand and that you're leveraging all the tools available to you to you to protect yourself and your client's information, uh, being able to kind of leverage that, I, I highly recommend an assessment, either, you know, maybe every couple of years. If you haven't done one, now's a good time to do it. There are a lot of great, um, you know, organizations out there that can perform those and give you, you know, the, you know, kind of best practices, how you can currently protect yourself and your client's information. Um, the next one is kind of uh, client relationship management tools, those CRM tools, the ability to compete where, you know, you're actually reaching out, you're, you know, you're sending newsletters, you're disseminating information that is useful and helpful to your client base. By doing that, you're always encouraging, you know, firm growth, whether it's repeat business or referral business. I think a lot of firms are competing um, because they're using social media and some CRM tools to make sure that, you know, the firm's message, the uh, kind of the branding of the firm um, is something that can be proactively shared and, and kind of encouraged with uh, with clients. The other thing I'm seeing greatly with where, where a lot of my clients are seeing great success is integrated communication. So specifically, your texting, your email, your instant messaging, your phone, your e you know, all of the different ways that you do communicate, having it tied into one centralized system so that it's no longer, you know, you miss a call because you weren't, you know, at the location where the call came in. Instead, there are ways now with, with, with you know, a lot of flexible kind of pointers and, and systems where your ability to communicate and have access to all the records uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that were created during those communications has become something that's much more flexible and integrated.
And another great thing is to actually integrate your communications into your billing and accounting system and your case management system. So we're seeing a lot of the kind of the, uh, the connections between those different types of systems, giving um, you know ease of use and uh, and really access to all the information that's being uh, you know that's being communicated through the different through, through the different channels. Also touch on the antivirus and malware. We're seeing endpoint antivirus, which is more uh, managed for you, and uh, it requires very strict protocols for adherence to, you know, that endpoint. Um, that, that we're seeing advantages there where firms are getting better protection, and it's no longer kind of piecemeal updates throughout the organization for patches or whatnot. Instead, you can create kind of a, a system-wide schedule and know that the end result is you are as protected as possible because everybody is updated. Everybody has the same kind of tools um, in real time kind of protecting um, your, you know, your technology, right? And finally, the, uh, the kind of multiple uh, geographically redundant and verified backups is, you know, a trend that, you know, clearly everyone has been backing up their systems for some time now, but there are now, um, you know, sync folders and uh, and real-time kind of incremental backup schedules that can protect you in a way that pr was not uh, was not possible before. So it's no longer that you'll be a week be behind uh, in, you know, a backup, and if you did have to roll back, you would lose, you know, potentially, a, a, you know, a significant amount of time. Instead, what we're really seeing is kind of real-time, um, you know, multiple uh, kind of uh, systems with multiple layers and uh, and redundancy, so you're never unprotected, and you always ha will have access to a verified backup. And the verified is important there because a lot of individuals who even have a backup system do not uh, ha or have not verified that should, in a, in a worst case scenario, should they need to restore it, that it would be you know accurate and, and it, an accurate and quick process. So that's something that uh, that we're seeing is that these backup strategies are now more um, you know are more closely uh, involved in real time protections and with verification kind of testing. So everything's tested, tried and true, you to, and you'll never lose, you know, more than an hour or so if you need to kind of roll back. The final thing I want to touch on, this has to maybe do with the cloud infrastructure as well, is the idea of virtualizing workstations and the entire network. The, the trend there is to protect yourself by being able to kind of reset every computer and server and device and file and whatnot. It's a different concept than just having a backup that you can go back and you know uh, restore specific data or document. Instead, what we're seeing now is entire environments are being virtualized. So should you be attacked by a ransomware, and we'll get into that in some detail in a few minutes, should you be attacked, um, sometimes it's impossible to prevent, how would you then kind of uh, reset your system? With virtualization, it means that down to literally the workstation level, each computer is kind of uh, captured as its own um, you know, snapshot. So being able to kind of restore the entire environment is, a, is the best way really to protect yourself should you know, a, a ransomware encryption uh, affect the entire firm. So some of the, those are some of the trends and innovations that I've, that I've seen. Um, these are things that you know, if, you, if you don't have uh, implemented or you don't have a strategy to implement them soon, you can certainly reach out to, uh, to me and I'm, I'm happy to kind of point you in the right direction and give you more information on these, uh, these trends. Um, I also wanted to touch on blockchain, and it may be a, a concept that you've heard, but it really is um, kind of a revolutionary way uh, that the legal industry and actually many other industries, finance, insurance, uh, intellectual property, and things like that, even real estate. But blockchain, really what it becomes is the ability to create um, dynamic transactions, right? So what you're doing is you're decentralizing the database, the content of information that will become part of agreements, let's say. Um, and what it really does is this decentralized database combines the computing, like how, how you know, your, your contract, let's say, um, or a, a transaction is, uh, is organized. What it does is it combines the, you know, the computing, the technology that creates the instrument and the cryptography, right, the protections of um, the, uh, the actual information, one, and actually the, you know, the, the documents and the, uh, and the transactions that are created as a result of these blockchain um, smart contracts. So what it really does is instead of kind of taking a contract template or whatever agreement you might be working with and, you know, starting with a template, entering the, you know, the important information into it, but using kind of the template as a starting point where the layout and the content, the format remains the same, you just plug in specific information. What blockchain is really doing is actually it's creating smart contracts where it's no longer templates, but instead lines of code that then go out and collect the information and actually create um, you know that that uh, that kind of living or, or smart uh, agreement so what this does is it'll actually go away from templates but instead code will be used to assemble these agreements and they're kind of self um, executing which means there's oftentimes there's not third-party 
um, you know, kind of title companies or trust, uh, you know, trustees or something like that that would need to keep track of the information. Instead, once certain kind of milestones or activities have been accomplished or performed, then the contract moves forward automatically, right? So it goes to the drafting. That's significantly changed because it's automated to a, you know, to a great extent. The administration becomes more automated and even the enforcement, because these are kind of living uh, uh, documents or smart agreements, that's, if they're self-executing, they actually can modify and, and be changed based on um, activities that, uh, that would trigger, you know, uh, certain elements of it. So what is, so there's often this concern or is, is this going to automate, you know, you know, contract, uh, you know, formation, will it mean, will it mean that uh, the attorneys are irrelevant or unnecessary? I think it, it's not. I think what it really does is it gives opportunity to, uh, for innovators. So what I've seen is a lot of, you know, smart attorneys who are used to creating kind of agreements in a certain way, that expertise, you as a trusted advisor to the client doesn't go away. But you do have an opportunity to then work with a programmer or with, you know, a subject matter expert in uh, in creating these blockchain, uh, you know, kind of uh, code or the code to create these uh, these agreements. By doing that, you assume the role of not only the subject matter expert, but you also can bring to the table, you know, the concept of uh, of being able to offer these these types of agreements that can go out and pull information from these decentralized database. So whether it's regulatory, regulatory compliance, where the regulations may change, these type of block, uh, change, blockchain, excuse me, um, technologies can actually go out and, and be and kind of be, know or be aware of everything that, uh, that has been updated to, you know, to, uh, to, the, to the second. Right. So what it really does is any firm that's looking to innovate can actually implement blockchain agreements. And some of the, you know, Bitcoin, for instance, we'll touch on that in a second. But Bitcoin is actually one of the, you know, the global success stories of a blockchain, um, you know, concept being uh, Im implemented, but also finance and insurance and entertainment, whether it's music or publishing, a lot of these types of agreements that have a global scale and even different, you know, ways of being enforced depending on jurisdictions and regions and things like that. Um, that's really where blockchain is seeing some some great traction. So if you haven't heard about blockchain, blockchain, you certainly will in the uh, in the coming months and years. It, it truly is a revolutionary way to leverage technology and create these smart, uh, you know, contracts, smart agreements that um, that will really be kind of living uh, and, uh, and self-executing. Um, uh, via technology. Right. So I want to kind of then move on to imminent threats uh, that I've seen. Um, some of the trends clearly ransomware. You know, we, we heard about DLA Piper. We heard about these, you know, these Maersk and FedEx and, and uh, even Merck, these, these you know, uh, global entities that have been affected by ransomware recently. So what is ransomware? It's a type of malicious software um, programmed to encrypt data and block access to a computer and a system until money is paid. So really, what it, what it really is is extortion. It's not a virus. A virus just kind of corrupts data, or you know, can kind of hijack your machine and use it in a in a botnet attack. This is different. Ransomware actually cripples both machines and entire systems, and then well, you know, the the decryption key um, is then uh, is held you know for ransom. So in other words, you pay in order to get your you know get to return or regain access to your information and your data. I want to show you this slide, which shows you kind of the uh, the global infection rate. For CryptoLocker, which is a, a a type of ransomware that's actually a couple years old now, but you'll see that this type of attack, any firm, clearly in North America or you know around the world, is susceptible to attack. And law firms have been targeted more than mo any other industry because you're held to a very high standard of care. You have maybe healthcare information, financial information, certainly personal and sensitive information that you track, you know, that you handle. Uh, in a confidential way, right? It's privileged information that you hold, you know, that that client and the client, you know, trust you to protect. Um, that makes you a target, right? So here are some of the scary numbers. The imminent threat uh, is uh, nearly 50% of businesses in 2016 last year. 50% of businesses, small to medium-sized businesses, were affected by ransomware. 97% uh, of ransomware is delivered via phishing emails. I'll show you some examples of those in a second. And here's the here's the uh, the point that really um, that gives me pause is we, you know, we we learned of a study recently where um, a group was informed and educated about a threat of ransomware, and then they were put through these, you know, these kind of test protocols. Um, after having received that education, um, and then kind of being tested, 78% uh, of test subjects clicked on a link that they shouldn't have clicked on and infected their system. 78%. So it really goes to show how the education and really kind of the uh, the protections within an organization really coming down to training knowing what to do and what not to do is uh is um essential because once somebody has clicked it takes seconds 
to encrypt 200 files. Right? So imagine how many files you have on your computer, and I'll show you an example of an, uh, in a second of an actual infection, how long it takes. It takes 30 seconds, and then it propagates throughout the entire environment. And something else, this isn't going away. It's growing in staggering fashion. So um, in, in, at the beginning of this year, there were, everybody was, was predicting that there would be $1 billion in kind of ransomware revenues in, uh, in 2017. That has quickly jumped to $5 billion. And I imagine it'll probably double again, just because in May of this year, and in June of this year, and in July of this year, there were different variants, different kind of attack vectors for these ransomwares that were going out and really disabling entire computer networks, whether it's the National Health Service in the UK, or it's DLA Piper, a global law firm, or even individual small firms, you know, around the United States, North America, and the world, you know, that if, if you're doing your cost benefit analysis, and somebody is, you know, holding your data ransom um, for $300, $600, whatever the case may be, a lot of uh, individuals are paying that simply because they didn't have a strategy in place to protect themselves against this, uh, you know, these types of attacks. And unfortunately, the last thing, or the last item here, bullet point on the slide is four out of five people actually believe that having a backup of data protects them from ransomware. And now a backup of data is essential, but what it really means is you can go out and replace individual files but what we're really seeing is a ransomware is so nefarious because it breaks your system, like your computer, the, the, literally the machine you're sitting in front of is inoperable. You cannot use it, you can't access any programs on it. So in order to kind of restore it, you have to start from scratch, wipe it, and then maybe you can bring your, you know, your, your, uh, your data from a backup, but you have to rebuild that machine and every other machine in your organization and your server and so on. So the, the amount of time it takes to do that, I, you know, we've, uh, we've, done our studies and it takes about 46 days to be back to you know the uh, the prior state not many businesses can uh, can can thrive and survive if they're offline or at least partially offline for 46 days so those are some of the those are some of the numbers so I want to kind of quickly run through um, a common attack and this is something that we created in a sandbox environment um, where say you know you get a, a an email from FedEx that says hey we try to deliver it please you know fill out this form if you click that form it'll download and install you know uh, a ransomware or from Apple Computer, right? A lot of these uh, these are effective because they, you know, they they spoof or, or during these phishing attempts, they claim or purport to be from a trusted, you know, third party like Apple Computer, who's you know is who's protective of uh, of individuals' accounts and your information. Instead, what you're doing is you're infecting your um, your computer by clicking on this email. Last one, same thing. It's this exact same language that you would receive with branding and logo and everything from Dropbox, but in this example, this is not from Dropbox. This was copied and pasted into a phishing email where if you click on that view file link, if you click, um, this is what happens. So we, we created this. This is a, a, a video where the computer on the left and the computer on the right are in our kind of protected sandbox. The computer on the left has just been infected with a, with a single click. So right away, that computer is no longer operable, right? All the, everything is happening behind the scenes. It's being encrypted, and that same uh, ransomware is now being sent. So the computer on the right is where, you know, another, you know, uh, individual on, in the same firm is working away. The original kind of, you know, uh, person who clicked over there on the left is wondering, you know, what's going on. They're kind of trying to get access to their computer. Now they see this ransomware uh, kind of threat. So that now means this entire computer on the left has been encrypted. And now there's a ticking time clock. So, you know, within two days and 23 minutes, if you don't pay Bitcoin, you know, of a certain amount, you'll, you'll never get your, uh, your computer back. As the course of, you know, reading through that, that threat, understanding what's going on, now the computer on the right is encrypted as well. So within 30 seconds, all documents, all, you know, programs, all workstations and servers within this environment have been encrypted and will no longer be, um, you know, accessible unless you get the decryption key from, uh, you know, a third party who basically is, you know, a, a, a criminal enterprise out to extort, you know, your need to have access to your information, um, you know, as part of their, uh, their ransomware scheme. So I want to give you that, uh, that sense of, you know, how prevalent this is. I've had clients who have been actually affected by this multiple times, um, and it really comes down to education, knowing what not to click on, making sure you confirm and understand that a uh, an email that comes in, you know, who sent it, what it, what the uh, the goal, the purpose of the information in it, and to just kind of protect yourself as much as possible. Okay, and here's an example. This is a screenshot from that National Health Service attack with the WannaCry um, uh, ransomware virus that happened in May of this year. 
So unfortunately, this was patient information for 130 hospitals and clinics and, you know, and doctor's offices around the UK. Each one was, was broken and, it, or I'm sorry, each one was encrypted um, and, uh, and those systems like ground to a halt. And this is patient information, prescription information, you know, who's coming in for surgery tomorrow, that, uh, that entire environment went offline. And the, a corollary would be your law firm and every workstation, all your server going down and being, you know, in seconds, you being uh, unable to access that information until you either pay or, you know, or in some ways you, uh, you, you mitigate that risk. And we'll get to that in a second, some of the tech, uh, strategies that you can employ. Um, so if you have been targeted, the best thing, you know, this is my, my you know, kind of best advice here is immediately disconnect any infected machine. Problem with that is it happens so quickly that oftentimes you can't, you know, you don't, you don't quite get there in time. Um, certainly contact, you know, your, your support, your IT support or a vendor that supplies, you know, your, your IT immediately. It's important to understand which drives are affected by this because sometimes you can bring, you know, drives offline or you can prevent via permissions who has access to what shared folders. That's some ways of kind of preventing the spread. Um, you want to identify the ransomware variant. You want to, you know, maybe restore a verified backup. And that backup should be a virtualized system image rather than just data backup. Um, even as of April of this year, the FBI was still kind of tacitly, at least, you know, um, presenting the option of paying, you know, as a way of, of, you know, kind of remedying these situations. But they've changed uh, quickly just because of the spread of this, you know, the idea that the profitability of these types of exercises um, mean that it's growing, right? And each day we're hearing more and more about how, uh, how these types of attacks are, uh, are affecting law firms. Um, across the United States and the world, really. So let's, you know, now we're gonna kind of move to the idea of understanding and mitigating the risk, right? So ounce of prevention, training, that cyber assessment, uh, you know, that is something that a cybersecurity assessment is something I recommend strongly because not only does it identify how your system can, made, can be made more efficient in being able to kind of pro protect you uh, proactively, but also training staff, understanding, uh, don't install other, you know, third-party software. Don't have some people using Dropbox, other not. Let's make sure we have consistencies to uh, to protect us. Don't click links in, in unknown emails. You know, prevent uh, the install of unauthorized software. Some of this seems to be locking down your network, but it really ends up being, uh, you know, the, that ounce of prevention that protects you in the long run. Um, the endpoint antivirus, I touched on that. The virtualization of workstations and networks, I think that's a critical uh, need going forward. I think, you know, the ABA came out probably a couple years ago now saying that within five years, so we're still within that five-year period, two years in, um, all firms will start to move towards this virtualization or this idea of creating a virtual network that then is, uh, is protected and gives you the ability to reset the entire environment back to the last good state. I think that's extremely important because as ransomware, there's not just one, you know, uh, one type of ransomware to protect against. There's a cat and mouse name go a game going on where all these variants are kind of attacking via slightly different methods. Um, and what we're seeing is, you, you know, it's hard to stay ahead of that innovation from, you know, from the, uh, the hacker standpoint. What we're really doing is, is creating protection schemes where, you know, incrementally, you know, every half hour, every hour, every day, you're creating these kind of system images. Being able to kind of restore the last good state is your best way to make sure that you mitigate that downtime. Okay, and of course, the secure private cloud infrastructure is a great way to do that, right? We're in the cloud with geographic dis redundancy, multi layers of kind of real time backups and things like that. You're able to, because you virtualize the entire environment, that virtual environment then becomes something that you can reset, right? So you're always wanting to think about when was the last, you know, uh, last good state that we've kind of captured. Make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're looking to uh, kind of proactively have an environment that where you're protecting yourself by having that, uh, that kind of technology. Okay. And now uh, the tipping point that, that we've reached, right? So it's a, it's the, that magic moment when idea trend or social behavior crosses a threshold tips and spreads like wild, wild, uh, wildfire. This is what I'm seeing, right? This, this global for-profit criminal enterprise, this ransomware, you know, that, uh, that's based largely from Eastern Europe, but a lot of it is coming from kind of the, the, the struggles between Ukraine and Russia. These hacker groups are actually kind of targeting government institutions back and forth. But as part of those, you know, those efforts, they're creating new types of ransomware that then actually is being used and spread across the world for extortion. Right? It truly is just, you know, basically uh, stealing from the, something from you, except what they're doing is they're stealing it by encrypting it at your location. And they are the only ones who have those decryption keys. Also, there's certainly a generational shift that we've noticed where, you know, mobility, uh, smartphone, 
the use of many different types of technologies, whether it's software as a service or desktop as a service, you're no longer quite as restricted as, a, as you have been. Um, and I think the expectations for use and adoption of technology are much higher. Also, because the practice of law is information-based, that is certainly led to this, where the idea of not being, um, you know, or not having access to your information, you know, not knowing where the fo folder is for this case, you know, now with case management systems that, uh, that assemble and automate and give you access to the information you need, and then share that information with your clients uh, and, and outside parties in a, or, you know, co-counsel and things like that, be a collaborative, you know, secure online spaces. Um, that's something also that's kind of pushing, that's, that's part of this, you know, the, uh, the push past the tipping point. Uh, the secure access, clearly we've touched on that. Uh, the ability or, or client expectations haven't risen. You know, clients are now kind of uh, educating themselves and pushing back and, and kind of having very specific questions um, and utilizing uh, resources available to them to come into, you know, the, the uh, kind of arrangement and agreement with you much better informed. I think that's also kind of shifting this where um, the ability to participate or at least be aware of the status of, you know, a case at any time is something that where technology can help you with. Um, accounting, also the ability to track your emails, to use your smartphone and all the activities you do on a daily basis, have software or technology that's tracking that for you. It means that the billable hour no longer is something that you're, you know, you're remembering or you're reassembling or you're kind of collecting at the end of the day or, or the end of a week even. Instead, in real time, as you perform the work that you need to do, you have, you know, systems and tools that are tracking that for you. So it's a nice way to make sure that you're very accurately and efficiently uh, being aware of what you're doing, what information you need to do it, uh, tracking that time, and then, you know, the inv invoicing and, and billing and, uh, and even kind of receivables, you know, credit card payments, e uh, e-checks, all those kind of things that are that are important are now available to you in a uh, in in a much easier to implement uh, fashion. Um, yep, and then kind of the uh, the the subject matter expertise also um, in financial. Uh, information, uh, technology, automation, and security on demand, I think there's now a, a much better way to have that information readily available to you. So you can go out and actually have somebody who, you know, imagine a bookkeeper who virtually kind of, you know, uh, connects to your system, uh, can perform that work, and then, you know, and then closes that session. So what, what we're seeing is a lot of kind of consulting and expertise being available to uh, to attorneys who leverage technology and and the ways where you can rely on outside experts to give you you know the best uh, firsthand information that then you you know regularly use and leverage to improve um, you know the the, uh, the kind of the day to day activities and uh, and performance of your firm. So that best practices consulting is something that uh, that is has led to the tipping point tipping point workflow automation. You're no longer wasting time or using time to do, perform administrative uh, tasks. Instead, you know, with kind of proactive calendaring and, uh, and rules-based uh, workflow management, procedural tracking, you have a, uh, you know, more proactive, proactive and, uh, and interactive um, workflow automation. Uh, IT management now is something that can be done remotely um, in real time. Um, integrating your systems, understanding that you, you know, you may need multiple tools, making sure those tools work together so there aren't redundancies of information. You don't have to kind of update two different systems or three different systems in order to get the solution you need, create or, or, um, or establish an integrated system that, uh, that gives you access to the tools you need. Uh, consistent security practices have become a requirement. The training and prevention protocols are, are something that we're seeing uh, uh, more and more firms avail, avail themselves of. Um, and also um, kind of the known paradigms going away, right? Where cloud networks are and mean, mean that, you know, you no longer need to be at a device or at a location in order to kind of do the work that you need to do. You'll always have access. You can actually scale up or down. You could have a remote remote workforce, you, you can have kind of satellite offices, or for a large case, you can actually kind of have a, you know, a cloud-based um, virtual office with, that's dedicated to, you know, a project or a case with, you know, access to that environment being shared with anyone who may need it. So these types of kind of scalable, um, mobile, remote, um, cloud-based um, kind of infrastructure uh, means that you're no longer restricted to old or known paradigms for IT uh, management and also access to the tools you need.
right? And also kind of a strategic tech, uh, tech adoption. I think a lot of firms are doing the, you know, based on cybersecurity needs, are actually taking a good look at how they're currently uh, operate, how they're leveraging technology. And we're, what we're really seeing is a lot of firms are now quickly moving towards integrated environments, cloud-based for redundancy with um, that virtualization, giving you protection, one, you know, against any kind of, you know, disaster, uh, being able to recover from a, from a natural disaster, um, and a cyber attack like ransomware, where your ability to kind of roll back to uh, or restore the last good state means that you're only an hour away uh, from that last good state that can be up and running in minutes, right? It gives you that kind of protection going forward. Okay, and I, I want to kind of give you a quick kind of uh, infographic of a an example of a of a secure private cloud where each desktop is really virtual. So whether you're connecting from your desk at work or you know from home or on the road or from court, you always have the same tools available to you. So during that connection session, you establish your you know your your connection. You have everything you need. You disconnect, and nothing has been stored locally. It's that idea of virtualizing your law practice, having access when you need it, but also having it being protected, managed, and kind of uh, uh, you know, proactively um, uh, organized behind the scenes by, you know, uh, an, an entity that, uh, that has multiple data centers and really provides the access and hosting to you. So I kind of touch on that idea of cloud infrastructure as a strategic, you know, growth path for a lot, a lot of law firms that, that basically eliminate single points of failure, eliminate the reliance on a, you know, one hardware device, like, you know, your server, for instance, where all your, you know, your client's information is. Instead, what you can do is virtualize that, put it into a cloud environment, and have a lot of the protections that are built into that 